Andrea Hall, Robin Hughes, Susie Eisenhoff and I wrote a four-page pamphlet on childcare policy, which was given this and it was published bef well before the election, um, and it was used to lobby the Whitlam government. It formed some of the structural basis for what became childcare policy, including family daycare. Um, readership now still skews, as we heard yesterday, of the Australian 58% male, 42% female. Um, and uh, in my view, the times in which the Australian and indeed other newspapers and broadcasters of influence have had the best edge is when they have pushed the envelope on social issues and the, uh, the fair participation of women and their quest for liberation, I think, was one of those. Just in finishing, um, we've returned to the age of great dynastic wealth and this puts huge demands on the second and third generations. We've seen big wealthy families come apart in the courts. I'm no Murdochologist. I haven't read all those books about Murdoch. I'm glad Anna Torv and Rupert Murdoch had a daughter, as well as a son. I'm equally glad that Elizabeth chose a career with independence from her father. The old man, the King Lear, is um, arranging his kingdom now. Hopefully it won't disintegrate. Um, and I'll be watching with interest as many others, but attitudes to gender will be important in this as well. I stopped writing for The Australian in 1971 and went to join the ABC where, with a lot of other women, we started to agitate for a lot of the reforms and the modernisation of the ABC, which took another generation to occur. The Little Blue Mini, one of the ten that Murdoch dish dished out, and I had one, left our lives in 1967 when Bruce Petty and my first child was born. It wound up with the Aboriginal Medical Centre in Redfern and was last seen kangaroo, kangaroo hopping down Elizabeth Street, driven by Mum Shirl. Thanks very much. Julie, that was fabulous. Um, now, I, I said I was going to take questions after each paper, but I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to Graham, and then at the end we might shave a little bit of time off afternoon tea, if everyone's amenable to that, because I think there'll be questions about both papers. So I'm introducing Graham. I love his self-description. He is a recovering academic. Well done. <laughs> Formerly at the University of Melbourne's Australian Centre, he has been active in and has researched and published extensively on the Australian gay and lesbian movement. He is the author of Living Out Loud, a history of, gay, of the gay and les lesbian movement in Australia. He is president of the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Welcome, Graham. Uh, thank you. By way of disclaimer, I suppose I should say I've never worked in the media, or at least not for pay. I was involved with the Gay Community News Collective uh, and its front organisation, Correct Line Graphics Cooperative, in the late 70s and early 80s. I've never been a member of the Communist Party, but that's partly because I would have thought them too hopelessly conservative reformists. <laughs> um, and I'm not a media, media academic, I'm a historian. Having got that out of the way. Um, I want to begin with my favourite moment ever in Australian media history, which actually happened last year when Fran Kelly from the ABC's breakfast program on the radio was interviewing Tony Windsor, independent member for New England. Um, and in response to a question, he, he began his answer by saying, well, I don't read The Australian. And Fran, not one to be frazzled, usually kind of gasped and interrupted and said, you don't read The Australian. And he went on to say, well, no, I don't read many of the papers, really. I think he went on to say that he read the local papers from New England. But I think for Fran, if he'd gone on to say, and that's why I killed my mother, the big issue would still have been, you don't read The Australian. For me, this goes to the question of um, the Australian's political influence, which, of course, is talked about a great deal. It may not be very profitable, to say the least. Um, it doesn't have big sales uh, in terms of Australian media, uh, but it is influential. And that seems to me to be a question that needs some examination. 
and uh, I guess what we now call nuancing. Uh, whether it's true, or more importantly, in what ways and to what extent is it true that the Australian is influential? On whom is it influential? Um, and what I'm offering here in relation to the Australian and homosexuality is essentially a small case study where I try to think about the way in which the, uh, the Australian may have been influential on issues of concern to what we now call the gay, lesbian, queer communities. The story begins in the 1960s, indeed in the very first month of the Australian's existence, when um, what was, as we now know, a very liberal newspaper took an opportunity to express its support for what we would call gay and lesbian equality. In July 1964, so the same month the Australian is starting up, the debating union at Melbourne University had one of those kind of formal set-piece Oxbridge kind of debates, you know, three speakers for, three speakers against. The topic was should homosexuality be decriminalised? Um, and, and the vote at the end was sort of 300 yes and 100 no. The Australian decided that this was worth reporting and they did report it sort of on page five on the you know, bottom third of, of the, the right hand side. It was not hidden away, it was a reasonably substantial report. The next day, interestingly, they reported on responses from various public figures to this would have been seen for most people to be a surprising vote by the Melbourne Uni students. They uh, asked the Professor of Philosophy at Sydney University, they asked the President of the Humanist Society of New South Wales, they asked the Warden of St Paul's College at the University of Sydney, they asked the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne what they thought about this and all of them without exception said, well yes that seems perfectly reasonable. There is no reason why there should be laws against homosexuality. And again it was a reasonable kind of report, both in tone and, and size. You couldn't really miss it. For people who had sort of interest in the technologies, I don't know if this matters, but all of these people were in Sydney including the Archbishop of Melbourne, who happened to be in Sydney at the time. This must say something about how reporters go about getting their news. But it also tells you that they bothered. You know, they had this first report. They then got somebody to I presumably ring around and ask for opinions, to chase opinions. I don't know whether they were looking for negative responses. They certainly didn't publish them if they found them. Uh, a few days later, and of course again with the delay in technology, I think it may well have been a week or so later, they published letters in response to that, all of them saying yes, yes, that's right. One of whom um, identified himself, perhaps herself, but probably himself as a homosexual, pointing out that even a month earlier no newspaper would have reported that news, this sport. And I think the stuff that, that people have talked about and Julie was talking about in terms of the excitement you get from discovering other people think like you, is, it makes this a very important little news story or pair of stories. It's not hard to see why they would have um, published this. I mean, Newton was a libertarian. It's, it's seems to be extremely likely that he'd been against homosexual laws, anti-homosexual laws. Rupert Murdoch was, of course, um, a, a liberal by, by most standards, and again, I can imagine he would have found this not a particularly controversial idea. But I think more importantly than their personal attitudes is the fact that it reflects the kind of paper they're creating, that this is a paper that's interested in new issues or new takes on existing issues. This is not the first news story ever to appear in Australian newspaper, but I'm still running the line until I disprove it with more research, that it's the first to deal with the issue of homosexuality as something other than a problem, either a, pro uh, the, a problem for society or the problems of homosexuals, which is the way the transition was going at this period. Uh, this is a simple, and at some point I'm going to have to make the joke, so I might as well do it now, a straight news report on what's going on uh, around the question of homosexuality. There's not much then for the rest of the decade, but then there wasn't much news, actually. Uh, it wasn't until the formation of organisations that spoke for homosexual law reform and indeed for homosexual women and men themselves in 1969 and 1970 that news becomes, again, really possible. Uh, the Homosexual Law Reform Society is formed in Canberra, in Melbourne, a lesbian organisation called Daughters of Belitis is founded, and both of those attract media attention. Uh, the Canberra Times makes the running with the Canberra Group, um, but it certainly does get coverage in other papers, including The Australian. The really important turning point, and the one moment when the, I think The Australian really plays 
a very important part in the emergence of gay and lesbian politics, comes in September 1970, when on Saturday, uh, the 17th, damn, I knew I'd forget, it might be the 19th, but anyway, they, people open their newspapers and, and the kind of inside section, there's a full page article called Couples, which spills over into the next page and fills the bottom half of the paper, so a page and a half, including a very large picture, in which uh, Janet Hawley, who got a mention, uh, interviews John Ware, Christabel Pohl, John's partner, Michael, whose surname's not used, and hoveringly, oddly in the background and not really mentioned, is Christabel Pohl's girlfriend. So it's called Couples, and I assume that's because Janet Hawley interviews two couples, but one of them is, I don't think it's a mention at all. But they talk about this organisation they formed, they talk frankly, well, not frankly by our standards, but they talk openly about being homosexuals, what it means to them, what their experience of it has been. It's not a particularly negative story. And most remarkably, they use their surnames, except Michael, uh, and John and Christabel allow their face to be published in the photo that's taken of, of the three of them. This is an extraordinary moment. It's hard to think now what, a, what an amazing moment this was for people. Um, and it was in response to a letter that they had sent to all of the media outlets. So they'd formed this organisation called Campaign Against Moral Persecution, CAMP, which is the standard word in Australia at the time for homosexuals, except, of course, PUFTA, but no newspaper was going to publish that. Uh, so they call themselves CAMP, they write to the media, and Adrian Deemer, Janet Hawley tells me this, Adrian Deemer said to her, go and find out more about this. We're not going to publish the letter. Go and find out who these people are and what's going on. And out of that comes this enormous coverage, which, because it's a national newspaper, has a national impact. And CAMP goes from being an organisation that thought it was going to be a little media monitoring thing, a sort of ginger group, to being a national organisation. Within 12 months they have branches in all state capitals, um, not Darwin, and they have something like 1,800 members, they have branches on most university campuses. It was an extraordinary, the impact of this is extraordinary. It also has an impact on the wider media world. Uh, John and Christabel and then other people that get involved and people that send form branches outside Melbourne are inundated by media and they're constantly being talked to or brought in to do radio shows and they'll walk out of the studio from one program and they'll be snapped up by somebody else to come and record an interview for them. The fact that it's a national newspaper and the fact that it gets big coverage and on a Saturday when people tend to read the paper makes uh, that, that intervention by Dima really important. And it reflects, I think, that kind of interesting creative approach to, well, here's an interesting letter, here's an interesting topic, but can we do more with it than that? Um, and I think that's important. However, taking all this stuff from the 1960s through to 1970 and beyond, the Australian is really only uh, reflecting the rise of the kind of modernising liberalism that we've heard quite a bit about uh, over this couple of days, and the rise of the liberal middle class to whom the Australian aspired to speak. And frankly, if the Australian hadn't existed, developments for gay and lesbian people during this decade would have been pretty much the same as they were, until you get to the publication of the article about camp. Now, that would have had a slower impact. It would have had the same impact, but without a national coverage, without this big, splashy coverage, I think camp would have emerged more slowly than it did. But these are ideas that all through the 60s were expressed in the Bulletin and the Nation, uh, the Australian Book Review, the humanist uh, journals and newsletters, the student press, eventually the mainstream press. So this, the, the Australian's influence here is not in leading, but in kind of amplifying the, the issue uh, at key moments. And of course these are ideas that have been talked about in the Western world more broadly. In the 1980s and the 1990s, into the 1990s, the key issues for gay people in Australia were of course decriminalisation, uh, which begins in South Australia in 72 and as you probably know takes until 1997 uh, in Tasmania, but state by state the, the, the governments uh, set out to decriminalise and then moving beyond that to introduce anti-discrimination legislation. By and large, the Australian reported this very straightforwardly. They, they didn't oppose it. Uh, it was really just news. They weren't all that interested. The other big issue of the 80s, of course, was HIV AIDS. Now, the Australian went on referring its headlines to, and it used the quote marks itself, the gay plague, for a little bit longer than everybody else. Um, 
And in, as late as 1983, just as the issue was taking off, the gay community, of course, had discovered this as early as 81, 82. By 83, the mainstream press is starting to show some interest. Um, and in 1983, somebody wrote to The Australian uh, blaming them for their coverage, accusing them of pub being published 20-something articles in the previous few months but ignoring the AIDS Action Committee that had been established in Sydney by the gay community, uh, ignoring their press release, choosing to report Fred Niles' comments instead. So it was a, a critical letter, a, a critical of, of the, AIDS, the Australians' coverage, which is described as inflammatory, alarmist and moralistic. It doesn't look as bad as some, what some of the other papers were doing at the time, but you know, we're at a time when people were desperately taking steps to save their lives and the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of others, that the tone in the letter writer is not unreasonable. On the 25th of August 1984, so we're well into the, the AIDS crisis at this point, but not yet at the Brisbane babies, when the Brisbane babies died of um, HIV infected blood uh, and the, the issue exploded, we're not there yet. In August 1984, Neil Blewett the Federal Minister for Health, published, uh, issued a, a, some kind of press release which was published in pretty much every paper in the country, calling for people to be calm, to, that there's not a crisis, that they mustn't panic, that we're dealing with this. It's kind of, it makes you want to weep when you look at the way the, the refugees are treated today. You know, a small minority demonised by a kind of ignorant section of the population, whereas that, you know, that is pandered to and incited. Uh, in our time. Back then, Blewett stood up and said, no, this, you cannot do, you, this is not the way to respond to this. And uh, the Australian took up that, as did most other newspapers, and, and published an editorial on 25th of August, talking in sort of sorrowful terms about the fact that there was a threat now of public black backlash just when homosexuals were starting to gain acceptance. They hadn't seen anything yet. Um, that this was a medical threat, one of which many, one of many that had emerged in this period. And they referenced toxic shock, for example, which is kind of an issue that I'd forgotten about. Um, and they expressed a great deal of optimism about the prospects for cure and treatment. So they didn't deal specifically with homosexuals very much. They're mostly dealing with the medical problem that is presented here, and that pretty much underlied underlay their response. You know, the bipartisanship, the massive amounts of money, the channeling of that money to the communities, the affected communities, the kind of education that went on in those communities that could not possibly be done in public without, you know, frightening the horses half to death. Um, the Australian held to that kind of line, as did almost all the West rest of the press. So what we have here is two examples where uh, the Australian is influential, it contributes, but it isn't leading. It's not doing anything that everybody else isn't doing, really. They kept their kind of mad uh, commentators on hand, you know, Father James Murray, about whom I'm not going to say anything much, B.A. Santa Maria, about whom I don't know, need to say very much. They're there doing the kind of ranting, but the editorial line and the news reporting is fairly responsible. Which brings us inevitably to the question of same-sex marriage. This is the great eruption of issue in the early 21st century. For those of you not attuned to the minutiae, it all starts in 2004 when Canada legalises same-sex marriage and people in relationships from Australia with Canadians go off and get married. They come back and they are expecting to be treated as a married couple here in Australia. <coughs> John Howard and Mark Latham announced that they will not have this and they very quickly processed through the Parliament an amendment to the Marriage Act to make it clear that this was to be a relationship between one man and one woman. This did not solve the problem. Uh, at a point where the public opinion in favour of same-sex marriage was probably about 30%, um, Latham and Howard must have felt very pleased with themselves, having got this through. But in fact, at this point, public opinion begins its steady march towards the acceptance of same-sex marriage. Far from holding the tide or reversing it, all they've done is create a legal obstacle, and that mobilises people to want to fix that. The law reform issue becomes alive again around same-sex marriage. By this stage, the Australian's neoconservative turn is in full flight. 
the idea that you think of the Australian in a centre-right strikes me as a bit odd, um, and you know you could probably debate that term all you'd like, but I think they are further to the right than that. In relation to same-sex marriage, they are, from the start, unambiguously opposed. On the 27th of February 2004, before it's an issue in Australia, they publish an editorial saying same-sex marriage is not on the agenda. Well, frankly, if you're publishing an editorial about it, it probably is on the agenda. But what they're really saying is that this is an American issue. Um, in the US, the issue is more Machiavelli than marriage. So it's not a real demand. It's a kind of political thing between various factions of the Democratic Party. That it's not a debate that we need to have here. That it's not a first order problem. People have the right to live together in permanent relationships. Same-sex couples should have the same property relationships as everybody else. It's kind of typical of the Australian to think of property, isn't it? They can celebrate their commitment in any way they choose, except, of course, they can't. They can't get married. And that same-sex couples should resist the politicisation of their private lives by pro- and anti-marriage activists. Gay activists who think this is a form of discrimination should get over it and focus on practical issues, of which there were many, and they were listed in that editorial. That's the 27th of February. Two months later, on the 28th of April, they published a second editorial called No Bouquets Needed for, say, for Gay Marriages. It's clearly written by the same author. The, t um, the, the, kind of the language and the arguments are very much the same, except that um, there's two changes. One is it is now an issue here, clearly. Um, and it's directed now not just at same-sex couples. Um, it's directed specific. What year? Uh, 2004. So it's the, these two things happened in 2004. Um, they're now directing their in argument to same-sex couples, not to activists. So they're sort of. I think they're aware of the fact that this has taken off in, in the hearts and minds of ordinary, certainly gay Australians, gay and lesbian Australians. The other thing is the kind of tone in the second one is a bit more strident. It begins by saying political wizards who want to raise an electoral storm, blah, blah, blah. People pho conjuring up a phony debate. It's that kind of, you know, we're going to see a lot worse over the course of the early 2000s, but this is an early example of that kind of dismissive kind of language. And again, the second article calls upon them to get over it, which I think is meant to sound kind of hip and cool uh, in the language of the early 2000s. The arguments that they put forward remained with them for a very long time, and indeed are still, some of them are still around. They couldn't rely on the public opinion argument for long because, as I say, very quickly the majority emerges in favour of same-sex marriage. And they couldn't really rely on the traditional argument marriage, which some of their commentators do, because if you unpack that, it's really a kind of theological notion. And most Australians don't believe in that. They think of marriage is between two people who love each other and want to publicly declare it and register it with the state. And, and it's almost impossible, in fact, it, it seems to be almost impossible to have argued against that uh, unless you fall back on theology. And then, of course, you can't do that because most people won't buy it. So they're really reduced to the argument that was in that very first editorial, that this is not a first order issue, it's simply not important, which of course in the great scheme of things is true, but it's really important to those activists and they are still, you know, a decade later fighting for this uh, in a way that we w I don't think we would have expected that, that might have lasted. The other argument that they develop is that it is not an issue, this is directed to the Labor Party, it's not an issue for working class people. And indeed there's a suggestion that working class people are hostile to same-sex marriage and the uh, ALP is doing damage to itself. Again, I don't think this is true. I'd love to see some opinion polls. I imagine the 30% who are opposed to marriage may well be working class people, but I suspect religion's more important than class for a lot of that, that 30%, which I think is probably where it's going to stay. Um, so, but these are the two arguments. They run all the way through the 2000s. It's not a first order issue. The ALP is taking a terrible risk by trying to deal with these, these kind of elite stuff. The thing about this is that it has no discernible impact on the tide of opinion or on the way in which the debate is fought out. Again, if the Australian hadn't existed, I don't think it would have mattered. Uh, and it, it's an indication that their influence or their, their sense of their influence is strongest when they're going with the tide. When they try to take a stand, even quite a strong stand, on an issue they can't shape.
they can, I think, have an influence on politicians. Although, to be honest, I think Gil, poor Gillard, uh, who makes herself look really stupid with this stuff, I think she's responding to right-wing unions rather than to the editorial of The Australian. Um, and Rudd, who, when he comes back in 2013, even as he's pandering to Western Sydney on the refugees and economic nationalism stuff, suddenly announces he's changed his mind on, relig on, on, on um, same-sex marriage. It's an extraordinary kind of thing, really. Um, which can only assume was sincere, but seems unlikely. Um, I, want, I want to conclude by just making a few points, specifically that the Australian and, and the neoconservatives cannot win on this argument. I, I, I'm constantly being accused of optimism on things, and if you've been studying gay and lesbian history, it's hard not to be optimistic. It's all been one glorious victory after another. <laughs> But when Chris Mitchell rants against academics, lefties, progressives, Aboriginal sophisticates, elite activists, as he did during the contemptible smear campaign against Larissa Berendt, and when his team go on about feminists as the sisterhood and cosmopolitans and other people who don't understand the real Australia and want to do bad things, they are ranting against the world that the Australian itself is trying to bring into existence. Neoconservatism wants both economic liberalism and individualism and freedom of choice and for the old social values to prevail. And you cannot have that. Smart observers like The Economist realise it. They're in favour of decriminalisation of drugs and same-sex marriage and so on. But the neoconservatives are stuck with trying to argue sort of both sides of the coin for themselves. If you blame the 1960s for the moral climate of our times, what's the alternative? The 1950s? I mean, it's not going to happen. And you can imagine there might be a more collectivist than individualist kind of view of the world, but that's not the one that might happen. If you blame the university educated, I mean, how on earth are you going to have the mass education, the mass higher education that we need, and narrow-mindedness at the same time? If we know anything about education, is that it, it, uh, it, it's an incentive for tolerance and openness. If you blame the globally engaged, engaged cosmopolitans, what are you going to do about them? Australia has to be globally engaged. They know that. They campaign for it uh, on the other side of their mouth. You know, you can't, can't ban overseas travel and news and fashions. The last regime to try that was East Germany. And I, can't, I don't have to tell you how that ended up. In short, I think we can say to Mitchell and the rest of them that we have won. Get over it. Thank you. <laughs>